August, 1485, near Market Bosworth, England. Henry Tudor, a minor noble and descendant of Edward III, stands at the foot of a hill. In front of him is an army that means to make him King of England. On the crest of that hill is King Richard III's much larger army. Richard is so confident of victory, he's delayed coming to the battlefield by a day, so he could celebrate a feast day. A marsh lies between the two armies. Also on the field is a force commanded by Sir William Stanley, who has not yet revealed where his loyalties lie. Suddenly, Richard's cannons open fire. The commander of Henry's forces, the Earl of Oxford, orders an assault on Richard's right flank, killing one of Richard's commanders, the Duke of Norfolk. The commander of Richard's left flank, the Earl of Northumberland, perhaps blocked by the marsh, fails to engage Henry's forces. Richard, frustrated but still confident, personally leads an assault of mounted knights against Henry's bodyguard in an attempt to assassinate him. At this moment, William Stanley enters the battle in defense of Henry. Surrounded by enemies, Richard is unhorsed in the marsh. But he refuses to surrender, having declared, this day I will die as a king, or win. But on this day, it would be the former. Richard was brutally hacked to death. Later, his nearly naked body was tied up like a hog, his own insignia, and paraded in public to prove that his kingship had come to an end. According to legend, the crown Richard wore in a battle that day was found in a hawthorn bush and given to Henry's stepfather, a member of the Stanley family, who used it to crown the new King Henry VII. Henry Tudor's victory at Bosworth Field and subsequent marriage to Elizabeth of York ended 30 years of intermittent English civil war known as the Wars of the Roses. Henry hoped his new Tudor dynasty would usher in decades of peace and stability for England, but it would come to be one of the most turbulent times in English history. Marked by religious upheaval, the executions of four queens, and continued uncertainties surrounding the succession. It would also be one of the most famous periods in English history, a time when gender roles would change in dramatic and unexpected ways and when England would take its first steps toward becoming a global power. Much of this was due to a series of events that had only a 3% chance of occurring. This is the butterfly's wing, where we look at seemingly small things with unexpectedly large impacts. By the time Henry Tudor's son, Henry VIII, took the throne, England had seen more than its share of turmoil over the succession. Two things remained constant. Kings of England were always Catholic and always male. For over 600 years, no woman had ever ruled England unchallenged in her own right. Statecraft in England had always been an unquestionably masculine endeavor. The succession weighed particularly heavy on Henry VIII's mind. His father had had to take the crown by force at Bosworth Field, and Henry VIII himself had never been meant to be king. He became heir to the throne only after his older brother Arthur died at age 15. By the time Henry VIII was 34, he found himself married to the 40-year-old Catherine of Aragon. The couple had just one surviving child, a daughter named Mary. Henry had no male heir, and England had no precedent allowing a daughter to rule. Henry sought permission from the Pope to annul his marriage to Catherine, so he could marry one of Catherine's ladies-in-waiting, Anne Boleyn. But the Pope refused. So Henry did the unthinkable. He broke with Rome, turning England into a Protestant country with himself as supreme head of the church. He then annulled his marriage to Catherine and married Anne Boleyn. There were multiple reasons for him to do this, but certainly an important one was his desire to produce a male heir with the younger Anne. On September 7th, 1533, Anne gave birth to a healthy daughter named Elizabeth. Anne would become pregnant at least twice more, but neither child survived. Less than three years after giving birth to Elizabeth, Henry had Anne executed at the Tower of London on what are widely believed to be trumped up charges of adultery involving multiple men, including her own brother. 
Henry then married one of Anne's ladies-in-waiting, Jane Seymour, who gave birth to Henry's son and heir, Edward. Less than two weeks after Edward's birth, she died from postnatal complications. Henry married three more times, but had no more legitimate offspring. He annulled his marriage to Anne of Cleves and had Catherine Howard beheaded for adultery. His final wife, Catherine Parr, survived him. Her impact on the Tudor dynasty is underappreciated. She served as Henry's regent in England while he conducted a war in France. Henry's first wife, Catherine of Aragon, had filled a similar role in 1513 when she enjoyed a military victory over Scotland while serving as regent. These regencies helped set a precedent for female leadership that would prove important later in the Tudor period. Catherine Parr also played an integral role in reconciling Henry to his daughters, Mary and Elizabeth, both of whom had been declared ineligible for the succession after Henry's marriages to their mothers ended. Catherine convinced Henry to reverse this decision. In 1544, Henry had Parliament pass the Third Act of Succession, which declared the line of succession, failing the birth of any additional royal children, to be Edward I as male heir, Mary II as eldest daughter, then Elizabeth. The act gave final authority over the succession to Henry via his will, which also stated the line of succession as Edward, Mary, Elizabeth. On January 28, 1547, Henry died. His nine-year-old son succeeded him as Edward VI. Edward's reign was brief, and because of his young age, dominated by advisors, particularly the Duke of Northumberland. Edward's one dominant political belief was a strong desire for continued Protestant reform. In February 1553, at the age of 15, Edward, who was still unmarried, became seriously ill. The possibility that he might die without children was a crisis for the Tudor dynasty. By the terms of his father's will, Edward's half-sister Mary would succeed him. But Edward couldn't stomach the idea of being succeeded by Mary, a devout Catholic, who would undo England's Protestant reforms. He also opposed Mary because she was a woman, and because her mother's marriage to Henry VIII had been declared invalid, technically making her illegitimate. Elizabeth, although Protestant, was also technically illegitimate for the same reason. The only other legitimate descendants of Henry VII at this time were descendants of Henry VII's eldest surviving daughter, Margaret Tudor, and those of his youngest, Mary Tudor, former Queen Consort of France. Margaret's living descendants, Lady Margaret Douglas, Douglas's son, Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, and Darnley's half-first cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots, were all Catholic, so unacceptable to Edward. Furthermore, Henry VIII's will had excluded Margaret's descendants from the succession. This left the five living descendants of Mary Tudor, former Queen Consort of France, all of whom were Protestant and all of whom were female. The mathematical chances all five would be female is only 3%. In his device for the succession, written in his own hand, Edward declared that he should be succeeded by the heirs male of these five women. The two most senior unmarried of these young women, Lady Jane Grey and her younger sister, Lady Catherine Grey, were quickly married off in a double wedding in May 1553 in the hope that one of them would produce a male heir prior to Edward's death. Catherine Grey was only 12 at the time of her marriage. But Edward's condition worsened before any of the Greys could conceive. He soon realized, to keep England Protestant, he would have to become the first English king to be succeeded by a woman. Edward eventually decided to skip over his first cousin, Lady Frances Brandon, and instead settled on her eldest daughter, Lady Jane Grey, to be his successor. Jane was only about 16 at the time and had just married the son of the leader of Edward's Privy Council, the Duke of Northumberland. It's likely Northumberland pressured the king to select Jane, so the Duke's own son could achieve the title King of England through marriage. On his device for the succession, Edward crossed out an S and added a carrot with two words, and her, to declare that he would now be succeeded by the Lady Jane and her heirs male. He had no idea, by adding these two words, he would plunge England into a nine-day-long civil war. 
On July 6, 1553, Edward died. He would be the final Tudor king. No one told Jane Grey in advance that her cousin Edward had named her his heir. Upon being told the king was dead and she would now rule, Jane initially refused the crown, but was eventually convinced to take up residence in the Tower of London, the custom for new monarchs. She put on the crown and began signing documents as Jane the Queen. But there was significant opposition to Henry VIII's daughter Mary being passed over by her little-known, teenage, distant cousin, especially since the move seemed orchestrated by the unpopular Duke of Northumberland. The Privy Council, after having initially declaring Jane Queen, switched sides after just nine days, declaring Mary to be the rightful queen. Jane and her husband were moved from their sumptuous quarters in the Tower of London and put into separate confinement within the fortress. Jane's father-in-law, Northumberland, was beheaded. Although Jane and her husband were initially spared, after a failed Protestant rebellion against Mary, led by Thomas Wyatt, in which Jane's father had conspired, Jane, her father, and her husband were all sentenced to death. At the age of about 17, she was taken out to the grounds of the Tower of London and beheaded. She would come to be known as the Nine Days Queen, though many historians do not list her among the official monarchs of England. Mary's five-year reign as Queen of England marked a dramatic departure away from the Protestantism instituted by her father and accelerated by her half-brother in favor of a return to Roman Catholicism. Mary would come to be known as Bloody Mary for her burnings of Protestants for heresy. Soon after becoming queen, Mary married a Catholic, Prince Philip of Spain, in the hope of producing a Catholic heir, but she never had children. In 1558, Mary realized she would soon die with no children to succeed her. She found herself in a position similar to that her half-brother Edward had faced five years earlier. By the terms of their father's will, her half-sister Elizabeth would become queen. The only other possible avenues of succession were the Protestant descendants of Mary Tudor, Queen of France, or the Catholic descendants of Margaret Tudor. Of Margaret's descendants, Mary, Queen of Scots, had the strongest claim. At the time she was 15 and technically Queen of Scotland in her own right, though her mother acted as regent. The teenage Mary lived in France with her new husband, the heir to the French throne, Prince Francis. But in the end, because her own succession had depended entirely on Henry VIII's will, Queen Mary of England decided not to recognize Mary, Queen of Scots, as her heir. Instead, she acquiesced to her father's intentions and accepted that her Protestant half-sister, Elizabeth, would succeed her. It was a bitter pill for Mary to swallow, in part because Elizabeth's mother, Anne Boleyn, had usurped Mary's mother's position. But Mary, Queen of Scots' father-in-law, King Henry II of France, believed his daughter-in-law's claim to the English throne was stronger than Elizabeth. He created new royal arms for France that incorporated the Scottish and English arms, hoping his son and daughter-in-law would one day rule France, Scotland, England, and Ireland. January 1559, to the ringing of church bells, the 25-year-old Elizabeth began a procession to Westminster Abbey to be crowned Queen of England. As her royal barge made its way up the Thames, cannons at the Tower of London fired a salute in her honor. It was the same location where her mother, Anne, had been executed 22 years earlier. Elizabeth's early reign was popular. She returned to England to Protestantism, but was far more moderate than her half-brother Edward had been, even having a Catholic bishop conduct her coronation. She was the last British monarch to allow this. At the same time, she and her advisors lived under the constant threat of potential Catholic plots to usurp her. And as long as Mary, Queen of Scots, lived, the Scottish Queen could be a potential Catholic replacement for Elizabeth.
On July 10th, 1559, Henry II of France died, elevating his son Francis to King of France and Mary, Queen of Scots, to Queen Consort of France. Five months later, Francis died. With her French husband now dead, there was little reason for Mary to remain in France. So at the age of 18, she returned to Scotland to rule in her own right. The last time she was in Scotland, she was only five years old. Upon returning to Scotland, Mary began a friendly correspondence with Elizabeth. The two cousins referred to each other as sisters. Elizabeth wrote, God could not have blessed these two kingdoms with greater felicity than if one of us had been a king and married the other. Mary no longer claimed to have a better right to the English crown than Elizabeth, but frequently tried to persuade Elizabeth to name her as successor in the event Elizabeth died without children. Elizabeth always refused, likely because legitimizing this claim might have motivated Catholics to assassinate her. For her part, Elizabeth tried to persuade her widowed cousin to marry an Englishman rather than a Catholic royal from the continent, which might have threatened England's security. Elizabeth hinted that recognizing Mary as heir to the English crown might rest on this issue. Elizabeth eventually suggested Robert Dudley as a husband for Mary. Dudley had once been romantically linked to Elizabeth herself, but Mary was insulted by the notion that she might marry a non-royal. Instead, in July 1565, she married her half-first cousin, Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley. The marriage of Mary to Darnley created a power couple in Scotland of perhaps the two people with the greatest claim to the English crown besides Elizabeth herself. This was a huge threat to Elizabeth. But Mary and Darnley's marriage would be a volatile one. Mary angered Darnley by refusing to recognize him as King of Scotland in his own right and through her relationship with her secretary and court musician, David Rizzio, with whom she was rumored to be committing adultery. On March 9, 1566, Darnley and a group of conspirators burst into the room where the Queen was dining with Rizzio and some of her ladies-in-waiting, demanding Mary hand Rizzio over to them. She refused, so the conspirators held the Queen at gunpoint and stabbed Rizzio to death in front of her. Mary was pregnant at the time, with a son she claimed was Darnley's, though some said it was Rizzio's. February 9th, 1567. Lord Darnley, King Consort of Scotland's bedroom, explodes mysteriously. His half-naked body is found outside, strangled to death. Mary and her ally, the Earl of Bothwell, are immediately suspected, though Mary maintains her innocence. Bothwell then abducts Mary, holding her in his castle at Dunbar. There he allegedly raped her in an attempt to force her into marriage. Regardless of whether the rape occurred or not, Mary married Bothwell at Holyrood Palace in the middle of the night, just three months after Darnley's death. This was too much for the Scottish nobility Confronted by an army assembled by rebellious lords, Mary surrendered herself on condition that Bothwell be allowed to escape abroad. Mary was then paraded through Edinburgh in simple clothes in front of mocking crowds. She was then imprisoned in Lochleven Castle and forced to abdicate to her infant son, now declared James VI of Scotland. On May 2nd, 1568, Mary escaped from Lochleven with assistance from the brother of the castle's owner. She then raised an army of 6,000 men, but was defeated at the Battle of Langside and forced to flee. With few options left for her in Scotland, she boarded a fishing boat and crossed into England, hoping to receive assistance from her cousin and fellow queen, Elizabeth. But Elizabeth was uncertain how to deal with Mary, given that she was still tainted by Donnelly's murder and a potential threat to Elizabeth's throne. So Elizabeth kept Mary in captivity in a series of castles throughout England, always refusing to meet with Mary in person, despite constant requests from Mary for a meeting. All the while, Elizabeth's Secretary of State and Chief Spymaster, William Cecil, maintained close surveillance over Mary. A devout Protestant, Cecil considered Mary to be a great threat to Elizabeth's security. After years of captivity in England, 
Mary began to dream of seizing the English throne. She finally found an opportunity in 1586 when she received a smuggled, coded letter from Anthony Babington, a 24-year-old Catholic English nobleman. In the letter, Babington asked for Mary's blessing of a plot involving six noblemen to assassinate Elizabeth and put Mary on the English throne. Mary wrote in response, The affairs being thus prepared, and forces and readiness both without and within the realm, then shall it be time to put the six gentlemen to work upon the accomplishing of their design. But Cecil had a double agent within Babington's circle of conspirators, and intercepted and deciphered both Babington's original letter and Mary's response. After 19 years surveilling Mary, Cecil finally had the smoking gun with which he thought he could extinguish the threat to Elizabeth's throne forever. In communicating the details of the plot to Elizabeth, Cecil added, I hope that God, which have given us the light to discover this great conspiracy, will also give us assistance to punish it. By this time Elizabeth was 53 years old. She had been born the second daughter of a king whose country had never been ruled by a woman. At two, she'd been declared a bastard, her mother executed. At 19, her half-brother the king had declared she would never rule. And yet, by 25, she was Queen of England in her own right. She now sat in judgment of her own cousin and fellow queen. After Mary was officially convicted of conspiring in the plot, Elizabeth still delayed having her executed. Desperate to finally dispose of Mary, Cecil lied to Elizabeth about a supposed landing of the Spanish Armada in Wales. Finally, Elizabeth signed the death warrant, but she delayed handing it over to officials for the sentence to be carried out. So Cecil took it and sent it on to the castle where Mary was being held prisoner. On the day of her execution, Mary wore a red dress, the color of Catholic martyrdom. She was the last of four women during the Tudor period to seek the title Queen of England and be beheaded for it. The following year, King Philip II of Spain, spurred on by Mary's execution, launched the Spanish Armada in a real attack against England in an attempt to overthrow his former sister-in-law. But Elizabeth's navy, aided by strong storms and the ingenious use of fire ships, thwarted Philip's invasion. It was Elizabeth's crowning achievement. Elizabeth ruled England for 45 years, but never married nor had children. When she died in March 1603, she was succeeded by Scotland's King James, Mary Queen of Scots' son. James's succession to the English throne united England and Scotland, and also marked the end of the Tudor dynasty and the start of the Stuart dynasty. When we think back on the Tudor period, we're likely to think of Henry VIII and his embrace of Protestantism and string of marriages, both spurred on by his desire for a male heir. Or we might think of his daughter Elizabeth, who defeated the Armada and granted the first royal charters to English colonies in North America, an important first step toward a British empire that would come to rule nearly a quarter of the Earth's territory and people. These two rulers serve as appropriate bookends for the Tudor period, a period that began with an England absolutely committed to Catholicism and male leadership, but that over time was forced to question these core principles. And while the reasons for these changes are complex, much of the explanation comes down to the simple fact that, though mathematically improbable, Henry VII's descendants were overwhelmingly female. This quirk of history has had repercussions that reverberate to this very day. Thanks for watching.